What is up? What's up? What's up, everybody? It's your boy Charles. It's your boy Charles. We're checking out Original Gangsters. This is a little documentary I made on from the book Original Gangsters, which is on by Ben Westhoff. It is on Amazon uh, uh, Audible. You can check it out on Audible. But I decided to make a little documentary about Ice T out of this chapter. Go ahead and check it out, guys. Let me and let me know what y'all think in the comments. Give thumbs up, buddy. OG. Though he's known today as a gritty West Coast rap pioneer, before he was Ice T, Tracy Marrow was raised in the well-to-do New Jersey suburb of Summit. In the span of four years, both Marrow's parents died of heart attacks, and so during junior high at the dawn of the 70s, he was sent to live with his dad's sister in View Park, a middle-class part of South Central. But he attended the combustible Crenshaw High School, which in the early days of gangbanging featured both the Hoover Crips and their rivals in red called the Brims, who were later enveloped into the Bloods. The Crips kept their rag in the left pocket. The Crips pierced their left ear. The Brims did everything in the right, like a mirror image, Ice-T wrote in his memoir, Ice. But before long, members of other gangs started transferring, and soon anyone who attended Crenshaw, whether or not they were even in a gang, was assumed to represent the Crips and thus eligible for beatdowns from rivals. Ice-T said West Side Crips leader Stanley Tukey Williams sometimes dropped by Crenshaw with his equally muscle-bound comrade, Jamel Barnes. Most days, they dressed identically in farm or overalls with the bib down, showing off their bare chests, shoulders, and arms, Ice-T wrote, adding that at house parties, they were trailed by young Crips who rubbed baby oil on their muscles, to impress the girls. Ice-T never formally joined the Crips, but hung around with members he got to know through his girlfriend, who lived in a Hoover Crip neighborhood. Like so many others, he got caught up in gang's primary appeal. Affection. My aunt never said she loved me, he wrote. My mother and father were never big on that word. You get to Crenshaw, and you got a male friend saying, Cuz... Ain't nothing never finna happen to you, homie. You safe, cuz. I love you. At age 17, he moved out of his aunt's home. She agreed to give him the $250 monthly social security check she'd been receiving on his behalf, which gave him enough for a cheap apartment and cans of Chef Boyardee. <laughs> Before graduating, he got his 10th grade girlfriend pregnant, and he decided to join the Army, where he spent four years serving in Hawaii and becoming an M60 gunner. Upon his release, he returned to crime, stealing jewelry, Rolexes, Gucci bags, as well as Pontiacs. Yeah, well, it's hard, you know. I mean, when you, when I talk to kids, I talk to them with compassion because I understand the situation that's going on. They think they're going to beat the system, and it looks like you can do it. But uh, I've been down the road, and I know that I've never seen anybody do it. No kid has ever been hurt over rap. Uh, no kid has ever been... Uh, killed behind any type of music like if you look at a rock group or something like that you might see what you might consider satanic things on it but it doesn't mean that these groups are devil worshippers or anything it just means they're using hardcore imagery to draw in a crowd kind of like a kid would do a skull and crossbones on his notebook he's just being tough as his partner started getting serious prison time his interest in hip-hop began paying off he'd already penned numerous crip rhymes Tales of intimidation and triumph performed aloud in front of friends like poems rather than being set to music. He said, fuck a crip nigga, this is Brim. So we pulled out the Roscoe. Roscoe said crack. I looked again, the nigga was shooting back. The pimp turned best-selling writer Iceberg Slim inspired Ice-T's stage name. He and his crew would show up at clubs and buy the mic, giving the DJ $500 so he could rap all night. After being discovered in 1983 while rapping to impress girls at a beauty parlor called Good Fred, where he got his perm, he agreed to make a single called The Coldest Rap, spitting all the rhymes he knew at the time. It paid about $250, sold well locally, and enchanted the hip denizens of MacArthur Park Underground Club Radio. There, DJs like The Glove and Egyptian Lover, and pop lockers like 
Lil Coco and Boogaloo Shrimp held sway. The spot was the height of trendiness. You couldn't buy booze but could bring your own in. And it hosted the Cold Crush Brothers and even Madonna. Madonna drew us up on stage into her show, was trying to undress us and shit, the glove said. The white kids at the radio knew every word of the coldest rap by the time Ice-T performed there. He became the club's house MC, pulling up each weekend in his criminally funded Porsche and appearing in 1984's breakdance exploitation film, Breakin', which was inspired by the venue. In the rather corny film, the Mary Lou Retton-esque lead teams up with street toughs outfitted in studded belts, chains, and spiked wristbands. Following Breakin', the club moved to a different venue downtown and became known as Radiotron. Another good vibe spot was Lemert Park's I Fresh, a rap workshop partly funded by a state grant. Running from 1984 to 1989, it allowed young MCs to hone their crafts, including South Central rapper Yo-Yo, whose high school English teacher turned her onto the program and who would go on to record with Ice Cube. She was really good on her feet, bubbly and really creative right at the tip of her fingers, said iFresh organizer Ben Caldwell. Not encouraged, however, was Eazy-E, who refused to capitulate to Caldwell's demands to jettison his misogynist lyrics. iFresh later morphed into the famed weekly open mic session held at the nearby Good Life Cafe, which spawned the Project Blowed sessions. Before things got gangsta, I Fresh and Radio characterized an optimistic era in Los Angeles when racially and socioeconomically mixed groups of kids got down together. Even New York's king hip-hop impresario Africa Bambada was impressed with the L.A. scene. It brought together punk rockers, new wavers, hip-hoppers, he said. You could hear funk, reggae all up in one club. It was like George Clinton said, one nation under a groove. As for Ice-T, by now he'd developed something of an identity crisis. In the early 80s, he wore then-fashionable tight leather get-ups, spikes, and biker gloves, patterned after New York artists like Melly Mel from The Furious Five. His early songs weren't very tough. But one day, while he and his friend Randy Mack were jamming to the Beastie Boys song Hold It Now, Hit It, Mack made a bold suggestion. Ice-T should abandon the costume and rap about the real-life details of his recently cast-off criminal lifestyle. The resulting landmark 1986 song, Six in the Morning, embraced what was happening on the streets of South Central. Named for the LAPD's early hours battering ram raids, the song's protagonist flees the police, beats women, and mows down adversaries. It soon became a local hit. Gangster Boogie The poet and spoken word performer Gil Scott Heron, best known for The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, was undoubtedly influential on early hip-hop, as were politically-minded spoken word groups like The Last Poets and The Watts Prophets. But much of early rap was bawdy entertainment, influenced by the pimpadelic black comedy tradition, which included Rudy Ray Moore's dirty joke-telling character, Dolomite, as well as the proudly scatological comedian and musician Blowfly. You can also see the influence of traditional African-American arts like the insult game The Dozens and Toasting, which features braggadocious rhyming stories of a character's exploits. As the 70s turned into the 80s, disco, raunchy comedy records, and rap all began to merge, and it can be hard to tell the difference. You're saying, picking out you're the saying, hardcore why is it rapper rolling, to follow. It rolls out in all different ways. Like these T-shirts with these signs on them, they are absolutely ludicrous. With this back the whatever up, and niggas are not whatever, and uh, um, bees aren't ain't nothing <coughs> but it. Yeah. I mean, that it, it just keeps mushrooming and rolling over. It's a domino effect. The question effect. is, why do the kids like that? They tonight? like it because no one's telling them, no one's taking the time to talk to a lot of children and make them think. No, it's because of the conditions and around the society, them set up and that and makes that turn out to be what's attractive. Sex, 
homosexuality, prostitution, and violence. Its sing-songy rap is performed by King Monkey, the alias of comedian Jimmy Thompson. But it, like most early hip-hop, lacked the hard, percussion-driven sound we came to associate with rap. That would dominate after Run DMC helped change things with their 1983 song, Sucker MCs, which popularized a sparse drum machine beat that sounded great out of boomboxes. Run DMC weren't gangster rappers, but they influenced the man credited with launching the gangster sound, Philadelphia Schoolie D. Born Jesse Bonds Weaver Jr., he was raised in West Philadelphia as one of nine kids and witnessed a pair of murders growing up. An intimidating presence, he wrote, performed, and pressed up his own records. Once brandishing a firearm at a record plant employee he accused of bootlegging his work. The protagonist of his 1984 track, Gangster Boogie, deals weed, max the ladies, and flashes his 8mm at a would-be jacker. But the song Schoolie D released the next year, called PSK, What Does It Mean?, is considered the first gangster rap song. PSK shouts out Schoolie D's neighborhood gang, Parkside Killers, and follows the exploits of a local troublemaker who's driving around town smoking weed and drinking beer. Got to the place and who did I see? A sucker-ass nigga trying to sound like me. Put my pistol up against his head and said, you sucker-ass nigga, I should shoot you dead. <laughs> Schoolie D didn't initially feature such strong language in his songs, but began gaining attention for his music when he started talking the way people talk on the streets, he said. PSK became a phenomenon. It's got an eerie lo-fi quality, with huge drums and vicious scratching reverberating as if throughout a cavernous hall. My jaw dropped, wrote Ice-T about the first time he heard it. I turned to my homie and said, Yo, this shit is so dusted. It sounded different than regular hip-hop. It sounded like you were high. PSK inspired Ice-T's Six in the Morning, which sounds even more like the tough hip-hop to come. Produced by the unknown DJ, an enigmatic early world-class wrecking crew member who refused to let anyone take his picture, it succeeds through its details. Our hero's squeaking Adidas, his plush truck, his associate's chiming pager, the march of the battering ram. Got a knot in my pocket when at least a gram... Gold on my neck, my pistol's close at hand. I'm a self-made monster of the city streets, remotely controlled by hard hip-hop beats. I rap about what I know, Ice-T said in 1986. If I grew up in a nice neighborhood and lived in a half-million-dollar house, I'd be rapping about gold silverware and maids. But I didn't. I grew up in south-central L.A. At the time, he recorded Six in the Morning. Ice-T actually was living in Hollywood, but he remained Adidas-clad, thin, and a bit paranoid, with submachine guns hanging on his apartment wall as a form of decoration. The song was a revelation. When Ice-T performed it at a South Bronx movie house in 1986, it went over like gangbusters with New York kingmakers Rakim and KRS-One. It shocked people when he said, We beat the bitch down in the goddamn street said Africa Islam, another Ice-T producer. Back then, people didn't associate Los Angeles with hood stories. We thought it was all Hollywood and Malibu Beach. Ice-T would be the first rapper signed to Sire Records, Madonna's label. Meanwhile, in 1987, KRS-One, Scott LaRock, and D-Nice, together Boogie Down Productions, released an early classic gangster album, Criminal Minded. Nonetheless, Terry just unloaded on him, said Martinez. I could see him getting angrier and angrier. I heard your fucking track, Dre said in Terry's recollection. Fuck you, bitch. Fuck you, Mr. Ultimate Breaks and Beats, she yelled back, referencing a popular series of vinyl albums containing sample-ready break beats. One more fucking word, he added, a threat she ignored. And he punched me in the eye, she said. And when I didn't go down, he punched me in the mouth. 
He punched her hard, really hard. For more of these fascinating stories in true crimes, subscribe to Charles Arnes World. Thanks for watching. Looking for a professional photographer for your next big event? Need video of your special day? Then look no further, for $100 an hour have a professional photographer or videographer, shoot your wedding, birthday party, quinceanera bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, anniversary party or whatever your special occasion may be. Highlight your event with professional, crisp, photos and video. Check out Charles Arnes Photography on Instagram as well as book us for your next event. Must live in the Southern California area. Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm gonna check it out. Earl, Earl by DMX, the autobiography of, of DMX. Earl, this is chapter 17, A Weekend in the Hamptons. Hit that thumbs up button, and I'm gonna come back with my reaction. Hit that thumbs up button. 17, A Weekend in the Hamptons. The number of stolen cars I drove around Yonkers, it's ironic the first time I was actually caught for the crime was in Long Island. It was Friday night, and I was with a friend I met at Children's Village named Dre. We had just picked up a nice Toyota Corolla limited edition and were bored with driving around Yonkers, hollering at the same girls, seeing the same niggas on the corner. So Dre came up with the idea to drive to Long Island. He said he had family we could chill with and could definitely find a hot party to go to. I didn't have a better suggestion, so we got on the highway. We probably should have thought how long a trip it was, though, because since we didn't leave New York until after 3 a.m., we didn't get to Long Island until the sun was coming up. So much for going to a party. So we just crashed out at his people's house. They lived in this small country-looking hood on the outskirts of East Hampton. In the morning, we chilled with his peoples for a little while and then decided to go get some beers. I didn't think anything of it then but none of his family came with us. In the late 80s, the Hamptons was even more the home of the rich and the white than it is today. Even though East Hampton was probably the most metropolitan of the four towns in the area, it was still extremely unlikely to find two teenage black kids driving around in a brand new car. The rappers driving Bentley's invasion hadn't happened in the Hamptons yet. Black folks like Dre's people lived on the other side of the train tracks, and that's where the ruling townsfolk expected them to stay. But we didn't know that. I had already learned what you don't do when you're not familiar with where you are. But Dre was 15, two years younger than me. And the whole trip, he had been driving real extra, and I could tell he was thirsty to act out. When we pulled in front of the grocery store, I told him to chill. Yo, when I come back with the beer... We can go to the park or something and relax. Of course, when I came out of the store, Dre was gone. So here I was, early Saturday morning, standing in the middle of Main Street, East Hampton, holding a bag of beer. Not the move. Then, just as I started to walk up the block to look for him, I saw a police car drive past and guess who was in the back seat? This motherfucker went and got knocked. My first instinct being the loyal kid that I was, was to try to find my way back to his people's house to get help. The problem was that I really couldn't remember where their place was. All I knew was that it was in a row of raggedy houses that didn't look like nothing nearby. And after about an hour of walking around the neighborhood getting lost, the same police car finally rolled up on me. This time, no drain. I was still carrying that bag of beer. Hey kid, where are you going? I got some family that lives out here, I replied. Yeah, well, what do you have in the bag? Beer. Aren't you too young to be buying beer, son? Well, then you better get the guy in the store. I don't have nothing to do with that, I said with an attitude. That answer pissed them off, but I was right. There was nothing illegal about me holding an unopened bottle of beer. The clerk was the one that was supposed to get in trouble for not checking my ID. Well, you're going to have to come and show us who sold it to you then. I don't remember where the store was. 
Now the bullshit started. Well, why don't you let us help you then? If you don't, we're gonna start taking this bottle of beer of yours a little more seriously. Uh, well, okay. I guess I can show you where. And that was my first mistake. I got into the back of the squad car with no handcuffs on or nothing. Then, of course, instead of pulling up in front of the store where I bought the beer, like they said, the cops pulled up in front of the police station. Officer, this is not where the store is. Yeah, we know. But we want you to come inside for a minute. But the store is over there. We're not going to the store anymore. Now, come inside and shut your mouth. When I got inside the precinct, they led me to a small interrogation room where they started grilling me about the car. I knew they didn't see me in it or anywhere near it, so I just kept denying everything. The only way they could know about me was if Dre told them something. I don't know anything about any car, man. I don't know nothing and I didn't do nothing. Are you going to make us go find your fingerprints on the door handle, boy? Then you'll be a liar. And I hate little liars. I don't give a fuck. Do whatever, man. I wasn't going to let these cops massage me more than they already had. Do what you got to do. I wasn't there. Then I saw Dre's shadow in the mirror and I realized that the bastard was snitching me out. Give a thumbs up button, guys. Give me a thumbs up button. Let's continue on. After a few minutes, they brought him into the room. Is that him? They asked. Yeah. He answered looking squarely at me. He stood right in front of my face. That's him. His name is Earl. I don't know what he's talking about, man. I got desperate in a hurry. That wasn't me. I was already on probation and was not trying to go to jail. That wasn't fucking me. Dre was a minor. He was getting off once a parent came to get him anyway. So why did he have to turn me in? But the most fucked up part was when his grandfather came to the station and I noticed that he was wearing a badge. Dre's grandfather worked for the sheriff's department in another county, so Dre knew he was straight all along. But it was over for me. I was getting locked up. Earl Simmons was now a convicted felon. When I was younger, my mother and her friend Thelma had me scared to death about getting locked up. Tell them about what they do to boys in jail, Thelma always said when my mother was beating my ass. Just like the officers on Alexander Street, the two of them thought a good deterrent was making me think that on the first day I walked into a jail, somebody was going to fuck me in the ass. Well, it didn't happen like that, but I did arrive at the farm with a real hard-ass attitude. Don't say nothing to me. Don't even fucking look at me. I'm not saying nothing to nobody, and I ain't going to ask you for shit, so don't ask me for shit. The farm... The Minimum Security Division of Suffolk County Correctional Facility in Yaphank, Long Island, was similar to the barges New York State used to house inmates who were convicted of nonviolent crimes like theft or drunk driving. It wasn't meant to be as a secure or restrictive as the main unit of SCCF. Instead of cells, inmates lived in groups together in dorms or mods. You could freely associate with the other guys in your mod. Use a walkman read or play cards and while in no way did you have your freedom life in the farm at least on the minor block where i was wasn't the most difficult experience for me especially after what i had been through over the past two years in industry and mccormick now that i was grown though the hardest thing to endure was being without pussy for all those weeks and months that was tough there were some pretty female corrections officers in jail, too, and a lot of them were freaks. The freak COs would be the ones that lived right in the same hood as you and knew all of your peoples from around the way. Behind bars was the only place that I ever considered paying for some ass, because I definitely would have tossed a couple of dollars to one of them to knock it down. So this is uh, Earl, autobiography of Dan Max. You can check it out on audible uh whenever you get a chance this is really good man wow i didn't know he uh my homeboy just ratted him out that's cool but <laughs> that's why they always say if you're gonna do crime do it by yourself don't do it with nobody you know what i'm saying because when you're by yourself you ain't gonna snitch on yourself but if you have somebody that's with you 
they get scared, they gonna rat you out. So, best to do your crime by yourself. Anyway, what do y'all think about this book, man? What do y'all think about the late, great DMX? Leave your comments and subscribe to Trials and Ezra. Well. Hey, do you want some free money and gift cards? Wow, who doesn't, right? Charles Arnsworld will be hiding cash and gift cards around Southern California in the month of June. These gift card money drops will be daily. Want to get your hands on some? Subscribe to the channel to know when's the next money drop.